and it is time now to bring uh, David Keller in. Dave, as I mentioned, you are wrapping up Relative Strength Week, and I am looking at your first slide, and I realize we need to give you a little more time to prepare. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm a very much a, uh, as much as I love using stock charts and other uh, advanced technology, uh, pen, and, pen and paper it continues to be my main, uh, where I do a lot of my thinking. And it's so funny, a lot of times I end up looking at my notes and that's where I find some of my best ideas have come from. So I just, I went with the old school uh, way of writing it out and then taking a picture with my cell phone. So sorry for that. <laughs> hey, well, you know, they do say keep it simple, the keep it there simple, stupid, the KISS theory. And yeah. I, I think you've got it to a T right here. I mean, this is very simple, very easy to comprehend. I know exactly where the arrows are going. Um, so, all right. Thanks for the presentation. I hope you have a great weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, I'm done. Wow. <laughs> No, no, listen. It's great to it's great to join you guys, and I I've been I've been really happy following uh, Relative Strength Week this week. It's such a good topic to address, and I feel like a lot of especially individual investors don't put enough uh, of their attention to what I would argue is is the most important thing you should be looking at as an equity investor, because what Relative Strength does is it it very simply tells you whether you're getting it done or not as a stock picker. And if you're owning stocks where the relative strength is going down, you're flat out not getting it done. And, and, and the, the, the chart itself is the ultimate report card. That tells you how well you're doing based on what, whether that relative line is going up or down. Um, and so I've, I found, uh, you know, and we'll talk in a little bit about the ways that I think, but I think of relative strength in, in three different ways, the three uses of it. But just to start and, and frame it out, this is a, a graphic that uh, Alan Shaw actually sh uh, shared with me years ago. Um, and, and for those of you that don't know, Alan, Alan Shaw is a you know, legendary technical analyst. He ran the group at Smith Barney that later became uh, Citigroup and mentored people like Luis Yamada, who are exceptionally good analysts as well. Um, but he actually uh, came up with this idea. This is the way he demonstrated the importance of relative strength work. And if you think about it, uh, as an equity investor, I, I would argue you have sort of three things to consider. The overall market environment, right? Is it the market environment where you'd want to own stocks or not? It's the groups or the sectors within that market, what's working and what isn't. And then it's the individual stocks. And remember, it's not a stock market. It's a market of stocks. It's a market of individual names that as a collective group form the, the market itself. So if you skip any one of those three, I think you're, you're hurting yourselves. And I find a lot of people focus just on the market and they think, all right, the market is good or bad or bullish or bearish. And then you start doing things as a result. And if you if you miss the rest of it, there's there's three parts to this uh, for a reason. And if you think about what the arrows are telling you, um, if you're going to skip one of those, skip the market, right? If you're going to if you're going to eliminate one of these three, focus on the groups, focus on the sectors that are working and what isn't, and then focus on the individual stocks that are working and, and they aren't. Because if you think of your positioning from more of a bottom up perspective that way your market call will automatically emerge from all of the work that you're doing with the sectors and with the stocks. So, and again, it's not to say that you shouldn't look at a chart of the S&P 500. I do that every day as well. Um, but the idea is to make sure that you focus enough of your time on the sectors, on the groups, and then on the individual stocks that are, that are moving. And that's what's gonna tell you the health of the overall market. So, um, you know, th this idea here where the groups and the stocks are interrelated, they, they form up to, uh, to give the market itself. Now. Why do I look at relative strength? Uh, a couple quick reasons, uh, and hopefully for those of you that follow Market Watchers Live, you, you've seen other guests probably tell you a lot of the same uh, ideas. Um, you know, if you look at what uh, academia has supported, if you look at academic research on stock movements and what works and what doesn't, um, you know, one of the first really good academic papers on on relative strength or on stock market performance was uh, by Robert Levy. This was in maybe the 1960s. Um, and Charlie Kirkpatrick in a number of his books has referred back to this as a seminal work on relative strength. It really talked about the value of owning stocks that were outperforming and not owning stocks that are underperforming. And if you look at any institutional quantitative models, and most institutions have a pretty good quantitative uh, department at this point, um, 100% of them, if not 99.9% .9 of them, incorporate some sort of momentum factor, and that is all essentially relative strength. It's owning stocks that are working and doing some sort of percentile ranking and, and tilting more towards what working, what's working over what isn't. So long story short is 
at all institutions that I've ever worked with incorporate relative strength in some part of their thinking. As individuals, I find this is where people should be doing much more than they are. And hopefully in the time we have together, I can demonstrate some of the ways that I would, I would expect you uh, to use it. Um, it's a good time to mention, uh, we, we came up with a poll question and uh, on the screen, hopefully you have access to the poll. Just trying to understand which ways that you think of relative strength. And there's a lot of different ways you can you can look at it that we'll talk about in a moment, but you can look at the stock versus the S&P 500 as a broad uh, market benchmark. You could look at the stock versus some other benchmark, like uh, um, a broad market, like a Vanguard total market index or a small cap index or something. Um, you could also look at stocks versus their sector, uh, industries versus their sectors, all these different combinations. So I'd love if you went in and just indicate which ones you regularly look at. And then later we'll look at that together and, and see if there's any uh, indication, something we want to talk about uh, from there. So a quick discussion, just how I think about relative strength and why I think it's important. And then we'll get to the, the three ways that I've, I've used it. Um, this is a chart of Pepsi, and this is just one of the best examples of the importance of relative strength. This is uh, Pepsi from uh, sort of early 2004 to 2008. So if you know your market history, this was sort of the bull market coming out of the 2002-2003 lows, rallied up to the peak in 2007, then we sold off into 08 and 09. So this is sort of the middle, the, the meat of that period. So the question as an individual investor, if you bought Pepsi over here around 33, and then you sold Pepsi over here around 50, would you be happy with that? And probably you would be, right? A stock, you bought a stock over a couple of years, went from 33 up to 50. That's a pretty decent gain. Uh, you know, you made, made plenty of money. You probably feel very good. Here's the kicker, though. If you look at the relative strength line, so this is Pepsi relative to the rest of the market, you'll notice that for pretty much that entire period that I just mentioned, you were flat on a relative basis, meaning even though Pepsi went up from 33 to 50, pretty much everything was doing something kind of similar to that, right? You could have just bought the spiders or bought a broad market index, a mutual fund, gone to the beach for a couple of years and, and would have done pretty much the same with your money. So a lot of times as investors, we pat ourselves on the back for good stock picking when in reality, it's just market exposure that you're getting. And you're just getting one of the many stocks that gives you that exposure. So on the institutional side, which is a lot of my background, you'd always talk about beta versus alpha. And beta is just a shorthand of saying the overall market. And alpha is your ability to generate returns above and beyond what the market gives you. So alpha is your outperformance or you know, potentially your underperformance of that beta, of that broad market exposure. So you'll find that even though Pepsi appreciated over that period, that's essentially market exposure that you were gaining. You really weren't gaining much above the market. However, that changed very much in 2007. So if you look, the, the price continues pretty much unabated, a continuous uh, pattern of higher highs and higher lows. But look at how the relative line just uh, skyrockets sort of in the second half of 2007. Again, think about the chart of the S&P 500. It's actually doing this. It's actually rolling over at that point. Market peaks in early mid-2007, rolls over. Um, big blue chip names like Pepsi, more conservative staples types of stocks were the ones that did well in the second half of 2007, while a lot of stocks were actually, actually selling off. So as an individual investor, recognizing the difference um, from this period where Pepsi was appreciating, but that was a market performer versus here where Pepsi was appreciating and that was a, a huge source of outperformance. That's the difference between being a good equity investor and a mediocre equity investor, in my opinion. So the key here, the takeaway is to look at relative strength. It should be a part of your toolkit. And again, I hope the other pre presenters this week have, uh, have sort of shown why that's the case. What I'd like to do here is talk about the three ways that I find uh, relative strength to be important. I, I, I think of it in three different ways. One is as an indicator. So relative strength is a should be an input into your process. It should tell you when stocks are outperforming, when they're underperforming. And in general, owning stocks that are outperforming, broadly speaking, uh, all else being equal, is going to serve you better. You're going to do better if you own stocks that are working versus stocks that are not working. And, and that's what the data will support over many, many years, many, many cycles. So using it as an indicator is the first thing. Um, the second one is to use it as a scorecard. So again, once you, if you look at the charts of the stocks that you own, and I have a chart list with my current positions uh, or recommendations, and you can actually see is the relative strength improving on the names that I own or the names that I like here. And that will, that is your report card. That tells you whether or not you are picking the stocks that are generating value above and beyond the overall market environment. So the second thing is as a scorecard. The third thing is as a market barometer. 
And I look at a lot of ratios, and I, I talk about it on my blog pretty regularly, looking at the relative performance of semiconductors as a good indicator of overall market performance, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, um, these uh, you know, small cap versus large cap. These are essentially all ways of applying uh, relative strength for a broader uh, purpose, trying to understand market strength and weakness based on what groups, what sectors, what stocks are outperforming or underperforming one another. And I challenge you all to think about each of those three ways. And, and I bet there's one or two of those which you probably could be spending a little more time on. So what I'd like to do is just go through some examples of each of those and, uh, and hopefully just jog your thinking in terms of uh, how you might be able to apply in your own process. So there are a lot of ways to look at relative strength on, on stock charts. Uh, this is a chart that Gaddis Rose shared with me uh, when I was first getting, uh, getting started. And, and this is a, a chart style I think most of you, if not all of you, can access. Um, but what I like about it is the fact that the top half is purely based on relative strength. Um, and a lot of times, um, you know, it's very important. I'm not going to look a lot at individual stock patterns and price patterns in this discussion, but it's something I look at all the time. Um, but I think it's really helpful to look at just the relative strength separate from that uh, and just think about the relative performance on its own, because that's where, again, the, the value is really going to be added here. So this is Apple. And just to orient you here, we're looking at Apple versus the overall market uh, in the top. The next one down is the tech, tech sector, so the sector that Apple is in and how that's performing relative to the overall market. Below that, we have computer hardware versus technology, so what is Apple's group doing versus the rest of the sector? And then finally, we have Apple versus the other names within the group. So with those four lines, you can get a very clear picture of how Apple is doing, how Apple is doing relative to other stocks in its group and its sector versus the overall market, and also some color in terms of where the returns are in the broader market environment. And, and by looking at each of those, you'll be able to answer the question very well. So a very clear cut version of this is sort toward, of, uh, toward the end of 2018. This is going into the market low in December and Apple sold off on a relative basis into the new year, into January actually. Didn't start to recover until February or March. But here we can see the relative strength going down, meaning Apple's underperforming the market. Tech sector is underperforming uh, the total market environment this is one of the many sort of broad market signals that were pretty concerning going into the December lows was the underperformance of tech. Then we can see that hardware is actually underperforming the rest of technology, so it's not even in a good group. And then within that group, it wasn't even one of the better uh, hardware names. Apple's actually underperforming uh, all of those. What's happened now, though, is if you look at the six, seven, eight months afterwards, we can see now Apple stabilized and starting to outperform, although that's come down a little bit, uh, really rallied in the first quarter and then sort of had the sell off in, uh, uh, in April into May. And, and that's what uh, we, we've now recovered from. But if you look at tech versus the overall market, technology has essentially remained strong uh, for that period. So tech has been leadership and it's remained so. Down here at the bottom, we can see within cons uh, computer hardware, Apple was, hasn't been a bad name. It's actually been one of the better names within that group. But this is really the most concerning uh, line you can look at. So. If you want technology exposure, if you're looking for a group within there to, um, to, to lead and, and to help you outperform, computer hardware has not been it. And that's where this pink line is really, really important. So if you, if you ignore that, you basically ignore the fact that there are other parts within technology that have been uh, better than Apple. And, and just owning Apple and, and sitting back and relaxing really isn't helping you a whole lot because there are other places within technology that have, been, uh, that have had different return profiles. Um, and, and a great just illustration of how that might be different is by looking at Microsoft. So here we have a much different uh, picture. Uh, here we can see that Microsoft obviously has been a great performer on a relative basis for the last two years, generated a lot of outperformance. Uh, this line is the same from the previous chart, just looking at tech relative to the overall market. But look at how different this line is here. This is the outperformance of the software space within technology versus the hardware space. Then finally, at the bottom, we can see that Microsoft's been one of the better uh, software names, especially in the last four or five months after the market bottom, after the initial moves out of the December lows, Microsoft has really emerged as being one of the better names in the space. And here we can look on a price basis, higher highs, higher lows. It's a, it's a good chart all around. So understanding the difference in the two lines here, the, the outperformance of the group uh, versus the underperformance of Apple's group, I think looking at that sort of input and thinking of that, how, what it means for owning one of these names, I would argue is one of the better things you can do as an equity investor. It's sort of that second level below just the price chart that's going to help you get a clearer picture of where the returns uh, essentially has, uh, have come from. Hey, Dave. Yeah. I got a question for you. I mean, you were just pointing out Microsoft there, and it, it brings up a really interesting question. 
software has clearly been one of the best areas in the market um, from an industry perspective and within technology, it has been the clear leader. Um, and this goes back the last couple of years. At what point, and, and I'm a big fan of software and, and I'm trying to find leaders and there's, there's a ton of them out there, Microsoft certainly one of them. At what point though, when you start to see relative weakness in a group, I mean, when a, when a group leads like software has for a while, inevitably it's, there's gonna be some profit taking, you're gonna see money rotate for a, a brief period of time anyway. Do you have a set level in terms of relative strength where it becomes more concerning? Let's say software begins to decline relative to the S&P 500. And I'm asking you this from my own perspective too, because it's something that I, it's, it's more difficult sometimes to quantify than an individual stock where you can see a major price support level and so forth. Do you use relative support levels or how do you approach that? It's a really good question, um, and it's a fantastic question. And two ways I, I would say that I, I think about it. Um, and the one is how the relative relates to the price itself. And the second one would be some sort of uh, systematic way of looking at the breakdown in relative strength. How can you quantify it? So on the first one, I would say in general, you know, a good chart, the best chart is up and to the right, and the relative strength is improving, meaning a good price chart and the relative strength is going up. And, you know, talking with, you know, with you guys ahead of time and, and looking at, you know, just thinking about what the average chart looks like. The average chart on the S&P 500 looks pretty good right now, right? There, there are a, a couple that look, you know, kind of bad, but not much, right? The average chart actually looks pretty good. So the only way you can differentiate between the really, really good ones that you want to own here and the ones that are just kind of going up but not really adding a lot of value is with relative strength. So a lot of charts see the price going up and to the right the relative strength filter and looking for a divergence of, of higher highs in price, lower highs in the RS in the relative strength, I think is really, really key because that divergence tells you out of all the stocks that are going higher, which ones are not pushing it up enough to justify owning it over other stocks. So a divergence is the first thing. The second thing is, yeah, I think there are ways to, to more systematically look at relative strength. Um, and the one that I commonly look at is I look for a 13 week breakdown in the relative strength line. So a new relative strength low, a, a relative strength line that's lower than the previous 13 weeks, in my opinion, tells you that there's enough of a rollover on a relative basis that it should at the very least pop onto your radar. So that's something I routinely screen for. Our stocks are making new relative lows and, and 13 weeks is just something I've uh, I found is early enough in the breakdown, you're going to catch things. Uh, if you look for like a 52 week low, that, that a lot of carnage can happen before that, you know, that might come up on there. But um, something like a 13 week uh, relative low might, it isn't necessarily an automatic, uh oh, get out of the way, but it, it definitely should pop it up on your radar. That's what goes on a watch list for me that I start reviewing more regularly. Does that make sense? Yes. If, if you type in Amazon there and instead of Microsoft. I'm just wondering if that's one of the divergences that maybe you might be a little concerned with. That pink line where you're seeing- Yeah, the this is a really, really good example. And I would say, you know, you know, when you're thinking of divergences, you know, one of the common things you look at is when the price is making new highs, but then that outperformance isn't, or that, that, that up move isn't confirmed by the relative strength line, right? So, uh, you know, you, you have higher highs in the price, but lower highs or not higher highs in the uh, in the relative just tells you that even though it's breaking out, a lot of things are breaking out and you're not in the strongest part of the market. And the most concerning thing on the on the Amazon chart, in my opinion, would be uh, here looking at Amazon versus some of the other uh, you know retailers that you could you could have exposure to. That that breakdown in that relative line just tells you that there are other names within that space that might continue to to, to strengthen while Amazon's you know a little weaker in the last couple of weeks. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah, and I was just going to take you back to software for a second. That's an area that I'm certainly involved in as well. And there are going to be periods where you'll see the group. Uh, do you ever pay attention to I ETFs like IGV so that if that software stock is hitting a relative strength low, however, the broader indexes for software are also deteriorating? Does that play in at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, I mean, for me, I think of the market as a series of as a series of levers that you can pull and thinking of the and again, going back to the triangle that I showed you, right, it sort of fits into that thinking of the broad market and what configuration you're in. So right now it's undeniable markets at or near all time highs overall, any trend following devices positive. So it's an environment when you'd expect to want to own stocks versus not own them. 
But the question all comes down to the groups versus the individual names. And I think you're hitting on a really good point, Mary Ellen, which is, you know, thinking of, you know, looking at ETFs. And so the other, you know, I look at a lot of individual names, but also screen on ETFs, making new 13 week highs and lows. And it's for that reason, understanding when there's a group rotation, especially on a relative basis, that if you're just looking at the chart, and looking at the price itself, it's not going to seem as positive or negative as, as if you're looking at the relative strength line, because that tells that tells you more where the institution institutions are rotating to. Um, so screening is one way. And then, to be honest, it's the RRGs that I'll, I'll look at as well. So I'll look at um, a lot of groups, a lot of ETFs uh, on the RRG charts and just looking for where the rotations are, uh, because, again, a lot of institutions will need to be fully invested um, just by, by their mandate. But seeing where they're rotating in and out is where you're going to find the differentiation that hopefully helps you identify the leading sectors and not just the sectors that are, you know, sort of on market performers are a little worse. So just to review the, the three uses, I mean, so we, we've talked about it as an indicator. And again, a lot of times you think of relative strength as an input, and that's what we've talked about here. Also think of relative strength as an output of your process. It's also a scorecard. So if you want to measure your skill as a stock picker, Look at the relative strength on the names that you've bought or the names that you've owned. The scooter rankings are a great way to do that. So what I would suggest is at a regular period, whether it's the end of each quarter, end of each month, look at the stocks bubbling to the top of the scooter rankings and ask yourself, am I owning those names? And if so, nice work. You're, you're picking names that are really outperforming. If not, what on those charts did you miss, right? What what happened, you know, on, a, on Starbucks is a great example. This is a, a chart you mentioned earlier in the in the show. It's been just a great chart. It's been a great relative performer. Um, you know, long-term relative strength profile is strong. The price movement is strong. You know, what did you miss? At what point should that have emerged from your, your process, your, your, uh, your, your, your stock picking process that you missed? And how can you start to get more names like this in your portfolio? So as a, as a report card, I think it's really good. And then the third way I would just say is as a market barometer. So, you know, look at the types of names that are working and roll that up. That goes back to the triangle. Think of the groups and the stocks that are working and roll that up to the overall market call. Um, so, for example, in a strong market, consumer discretionary stocks overall should be outperforming consumer staples. Generally speaking, that's how it's lined up because it's sort of an offense versus defense within the consumer space. So uh, this was concerning in April and May when this line completely rolled over and all of a sudden you had staples names outperforming consumer discretionary. This is the markets uh, correcting a little bit. But if you look what's happened since then, this has gone back to improving where discretionary names outperforming staples. That's sort of a healthy market environment that should be encouraging. If and when this rolls over, that should be one of the market barometers, in my opinion, that should tell you, OK, hold on a second. Are things really as healthy as they might seem? Another common one is looking at just the relative strength of semiconductors. So in general, um, you know, the market can do well without semiconductors uh, outperforming, but it's pretty rare, to be honest with you. This group tends to do well when the market's doing well, it tends to underperform when it isn't. Again, this really outperformed in, uh, in May, which was concerning. But look at how that relative strength reversed. And now it's almost back to new relative highs for, uh, for the last year. Um, so again, if this continues to improve that group, I think that tells you you can be pretty comfortable with the market environment overall. But again, if this groups like this start to roll over, you have to be concerned. So this is actually on, uh, I have a, a chart list, a, a mindful investor chart list that I have. And a lot of these charts are actually on that, on that chart list. And if, you're, um, if, you, if you don't have access to that and you want to just shoot me an email, K at stockcharts.com, and I'm happy to send you a link to that. Uh, to that chart list to follow some of these uh, ratios, these relative strength ratios that I think tell you a really good picture about the health under the hood about the overall uh, overall market environment. And that's it. Those are the three ways that I, I use relative strength. And, and again, I'd encourage you if you don't, if this isn't a part of your process, hopefully by the end of this week of hearing some of us share it, you've been convinced that it, it, it definitely should be. Yeah. Well, excellent presentation. Uh, I do have one other question I wanted to go over. And I know this is an area that uh, Mary Ellen has a lot of expertise in as well. But we were talking earlier before the show about a company like Lululemon, L-U-L-U, -L -U, and the fact that when you look at the group, the clothing and accessories group, it's been such a bad performer or performing group relative to the overall market, relative to consumer discretionary. And that is a strong area, consumer discretionary. So it's a little concerning when you get a group within a strong sector that's not performing well. But what do you do with a stock like Lululemon that seems to ignore its overall group and continues to outperform on a relative basis, but the group is weak. I mean, what, what, how do you handle that? 
So, you know, for, so for my take, again, I think it goes back to all the different levers that you can pull, right? So all that, you know, for, for in, this, in this case, most of this chart looks really encouraging, right? Stock going to new highs consistently, trend following, you know, it's above all the moving averages. That's all good. It's outperforming the overall market for the last, you know, 12, uh, almost two years here. Um, outperforming, the, this, it's in a strong sector because it's outperforming and even it's outperforming its group. But this is the one area of concern, which is to your to your to the question, right? Which is the fact that its group is not outperforming consumer discretionary. So all that tells you is I wouldn't feel bad owning the stock. And again, if my portfolio was a bunch of stocks like this, I wouldn't feel that bad about it. And and overall, you're doing pretty well, and you're you're doing well on absolute and a relative basis. But all this pink line tells you is that you are leaving some of the best opportunities on the field, right? You're leaving them uh, on the sidelines. Uh, one, you know, just to go back to, to my background, I, I spent a lot of my career evaluating analysts, professional analysts, stock picking and, and measuring their stock picking. And one of the traps we would fall into is just look at their buy recommendations or their, their overweights versus their sell recommendations or their underweights. And in general, that's not a bad way to measure an analyst's performance, right? If, you're, if your buys are outperforming your sells, that's pretty good. And in general, you're doing okay. But that neutral line or the stocks that weren't um, being uh, addressed, weren't being uh, covered. So all the neutral or the unrated stocks, that a lot of times was the most important group. Because so, for example, your, your buys could be doing pretty good. Your sales could be underperforming, but the stocks you weren't rating were doing exceptionally well. And all that tells you is you're leaving the best opportunities on the sidelines. So for me, it speaks to the value of screening and always looking for stocks that are doing well and stocks that are doing poorly and making sure that you're routinely gravitating to the names that are working. So what this would tell me is it's not if I was currently holding it, not bad. I would probably feel good about it. But I would be screening for other stocks within consumer discretionary, um, you know, within other groups that might be having a, a, even a better performance profile. And those might be the ones you might want to rotate uh, into. Excellent. All right. Well, I tell you what, you did it. You did it, Dave. You hit the home run, <laughs> grand slam, you emptied the bases and uh, you, you brought home relative strength week. Uh, great presentation. I think everybody enjoyed it. So I think it's a good time to maybe take a look at that poll and see how everybody answered what they use relative strength for um, with this being the last day of relative strength week and having Dave here. Wow. I mean, it uh, looks like 76% use the stock versus the S and P 500, um, which that's exactly what I would have expected. I mean, I would have expected the benchmark S and P to be number one. Yep. That's exactly right. And I, I would say that, it, you know, that, that should be the first one. And if you're going to look at one, that's definitely the one. But I would say the ones that are further down this list, I wouldn't rule some of those out because some of those are um, some of the better some of the better indications. And again, we've just been talking about industry group versus sector right here. And, that, and that's, you know, telling you how one part of consumer is doing versus the rest of consumer. Um, you know, don't don't skip some of those other indications. And again, the some of the chart styles, Tom, that you you show routinely, I think, do a great job of illustrating all the different ways of slicing relative strength. So I, I would encourage all of you to experiment with how you set up your charts and make sure you're you're thinking of each of those because there there could be a theme that is happening that you won't pick up uh, otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, just about everybody that has been on Market Watchers Live, uh, you included, Dave. Everybody that was in this week, it's a big part of what we do in terms of managing our own portfolio or in our writings, teachings, and so forth. Um, this becomes a, a really big part. And I hope that this week, you know, the focus that we've had on Market Watchers Live this week in terms of relative strength has really helped a lot of folks out there because I really think that this is one of the most important parts of technical analysis. I mean, finding breakouts, seeing price action, you know, following negative divergences, looking at the momentum oscillators, all this stuff is part of technical analysis, but not understanding relative strength could be a really big problem in terms of portfolio performance. So I just want to thank you and everybody that's joined the show this week for, for your great contribution. Absolutely. Cheers, you guys. Always a pleasure to, to join you. Thanks for, thanks for doing the show. Have a yep. great weekend, Dave. You too. Next time, next time, Dave, we're going to get you, we're going to give you notice more than just five minutes before the show. <laughs> So you can get maybe two sheets of paper ready for us. No promises. And I, I will tell you, a lot of times I write these on paper on an airplane. So at this point, it was actually at my desk. So the lines were relatively uh, clear and uncluttered. So no promises, but I'll do my best. I like it. I think it's awesome. All right. Have a great weekend, Dave. Yep. You too. All right. Thanks.